In this video I'm going to try to explain how zero padding works. Um, I'd expect that you've already seen zero padding in action and also have seen the effects of windowing. Um, it's also useful if you have a good understanding of how the DFT works and you appreciate that the DFT basically works by comparing the signal being analysed against a set of uh, sinusoidal basis functions um, which have integer number of cycles over the duration of the signal being analysed. Um, so if you don't understand that, maybe it's worthwhile taking a look at some of the DFT and zero padding uh, uh, videos that I put together earlier on. Um, now to start off, what I'm going to do is take a look at a signal that doesn't necessarily need to be zero padded. Um, it's a signal which is one second long and its frequency is 3 hertz. Um, and it's got a thousand samples. Um, all together. So um, let's just evaluate the first part of this uh, code. Uh, I'll make the code available up on my WordPress site and put a link to it in the description of the video. Um, so I'm just going to evaluate the magnitude spectrum and plot the first 15 bins. Um, okay. So we see here we have the time domain signal which has uh, three cycles over 1000 samples and as expected our DFT magnitude spectrum is uh, a, lot of non a lot of zero values except at bin number three which has a particularly large value, a value of 500 and I'd like you to make a mental note of that value of 500. So we get this large value of 500 at bin number three and zero everywhere else. Um, what I'd like to run through now is um, an illustration which just uh, basically runs through how the DFT works. So just let me highlight this code here and we'll evaluate that. So what we have here is the signal being analysed shown in black and basically what happens with the DFT is that that signal which has been analysed is compared against a set of basis functions and the results of the comparison are stored as bin values. Um, now the first bin value or bin zero is compared against a basis functions which have zero hertz or zero frequency. Um, now they're not sinusoidal basis functions, all other basis functions are sinusoidal but the reason why we get this red waveform here and this green waveform here and these are our first set of basis functions is because the these, this represents here the one with a value of 1, this represents a cosine waveform of 0 hertz. Uh, if you took the cos of 0 you get a value of 1. Similarly if you took the sine of 0 um, you get a value of 0. So they represent the first uh, set of basis functions of uh, 0 hertz. Um, the next basis functions um, all oscillate. So there's the next basis function which has one cycle over 1000 samples and those basis functions are compared against the signal using a technique called correlation and the result of a comparison is stored uh, as a complex number in bin 1. So you, you should really be familiar with this at this stage uh, but basically this process will continue for lots of different basis functions but the key point is that basis functions all have an integer number of cycles over the duration of the signal been analysed. Now for this signal that's been analysed um, it has exactly three cycles over the 1000 samples so there's an exact match and when I hit the spacebar you will see that exact match so we have this exact match between the signal being analysed and the frequency of one of the basis functions present in the signal and whenever that happens you will get this large value in the magnitude spectrum and that's what we saw in the magnitude spectrum of this signal that we saw a moment ago. Um, now the DFT does the comparison with lots of basis functions. Um, in this case there will be basis functions of 500 different frequencies. Um, in this illustration I'm just going to go up as far as 20 but all that, I just want to remind you all that's happening is the signal being analysed has been compared against all these basis functions all of which have an integer number of cycles over their duration. Um, so let's just go back into the script now and let's see how this works for uh, when we're analysing signals that don't have an integer number of cycles. So I'm just going to change that from 3 to 3.5.
Now if I just reevaluate this, and we'll do the magnitude spectrum again, we can see that um, here's the time domain signal and it now has three and a half cycles over 1000 samples. We can see that we have lots of uh, non-zero values now. So we don't have the same situation as before where there was only one DFT bin excited. Now we have what's known as a spread of energy across bins um, uh, and the energy is accumulated around bin numbers uh, three and four and that's because the frequency of the sinusoid is three and a half cycles. Uh, now this spread of energy uh, is actually very predictable once you understand windowing fully and I will do a video on windowing uh, shortly. Um, but the key thing is that we don't have um, a one particular bin being excited and the other thing is that the shape of this uh, magnitude spectrum is quite different from the shape of the magnitude spectrum that we saw in the previous example. Also note that the amplitude is much lower. In the previous example the amplitude, uh, the maximum was 500. So what I want to show you now is I'll just run through how the DFT uh, analyzes this one, going through the same process as before, just showing you the basis functions. So just let me highlight this. Okay, so we have the same situation as before where we have the signal being analysed. It's got three and a half cycles this time. And I just want to emphasise that there is no basis function which will exactly match the frequency of this signal that we're analysing. Okay, um, And that's kind of obvious in some ways because we know that all the basis functions that are used by the DFT all have an integer number of cycles over the duration of the signal being analysed. Whereas this signal has three and a half um, cycles over the 1000 samples. So it's impossible for uh, us to have an exact match. But I just really want to emphasize that point that there is no case in which we have uh, an exact match in terms of uh, the frequency of the basis function versus the frequency of the signal being analyzed. So I'll just go through all 20 just to highlight that fact. And then I'll show you the workaround to that problem. Let's go back up to the top of the script. So, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zero pad that signal. I'm going to say x is equal to x. I'm going to add some zeros. I'm going to put a thousand onto the end of them. And a thousand is the minimum number of zeros that I can uh, add on to this signal. Uh, to achieve what I want to achieve. And hopefully you understand that in a little while. Uh, now I need to update n to being the length of x. So n is the uh, number of samples. And I'm going to say lowercase n is equal to 0 to n minus 1. Okay. Yeah. Let's just evaluate this. Um, just want to go to this stage. Okay, evaluate that. And this is the resulting magnitude spectrum after zero padding. And we can see there, there's my time domain signal. It's a sinusoid which has three cycles over the um, 1,000 samples. Sorry, three and a half cycles up to 1,000 samples. And then we've got the zeros shown here. And this is my uh, magnitude spectrum. Now, the key point I want to show you is that look at the maximum amplitude at bin number seven. At bin number 7 we have an amplitude of 500 which is the same as the amplitude that we managed uh, for the first example in which we were analysing a signal that had um, uh, three cycles over 1000 samples. So now I'd like to bring it back to the script and we'll just we'll take a look at how the DFT analyses this signal. So we'll just go through the same process as before. Uh, except now we're going to look at the zero padded signal and we'll see the effect. So here we have our uh, signal being analysed shown again in black. Uh, it's got three and a half cycles over 1000 samples and we can see the zeros here um, from sample number 1000 up to 2000. 
and what we're going to just show again is um, the signal being analyzed compared against the basis functions. So once again the DFT operates by comparing the signal being analyzed against signals that have an integer number of cycles over the duration of the signal being analyzed. And in this case the duration of the signal being analyzed is 2000 samples. And as I go through the various basis functions um, this is basically what the DFT is doing. It's comparing against all of these basis functions. But what we'll see is as we go through this that we get an exact match in frequency uh, for the case where the sinusoidal basis functions have a frequency of seven cycles over 2000 samples. And there we go. We see now that the red waveform here, which is our cosine, basis function which has seven cycles over 2000 exactly matches the signal that we're analyzing up to sample number 1000 and um, this is the reason why we get this large value at bin number seven as we saw in the, the, when we plotted the magnitude spectrum it's because we get this uh, overlapping uh, uh, between the signal being analyzed and um, one of the basis functions and all other basis functions um, don't exactly match, so we don't get very large values. Um, however, there are you, you do get some measurement, and really the value of the measurement for all other basis functions uh, it is predictable, as I say, once you understand windowing, and we will get onto that um, in the next video. So let me just go through all those cycles. Okay, so that's that done. Um, so basically what we're seeing is by zero padding we are essentially telling the DFT to compare the signal to be analyzed against lots more um, sinusoidal basis functions uh, which gives the DFT a greater opportunity to make an exact match between the signal being analyzed and the basis functions it's using during its um, analysis. Um, what I'd like to do now is just bring you back into the script and um, what I might just illustrate is what happens if we uh, make X a combination of two uh, sinusoids. So I might just make that 3.5 plus we we'll make this um, 7. Okay. So now we've got the combination of two sinusoids. Uh, we'll still zero pad by 7. Uh, or sorry, seven. Well, I meant uh, with zero, zero pad by a thousand. And um, let's just evaluate this section here. Well, I just need to change this to uh, a larger value so I can see all the components. Uh, I'll just change it to 25. And we'll reevaluate all of this. Okay. And there's the magnitude spectrum that we'll see. Okay, so the time domain signal, that's the combination of the two sinusoids, one of three and a half cycles over 1,000 samples, and the other one is seven cycles over 1,000 samples. Um, and down below is the magnitude spectrum. And what we can see is that the shape of each of the components, so that's the three and a half components in the frequency domain, and there's the seven uh, hertz component in the frequency domain. The shape of these components is uh, similar, which makes it easier to identify them in the magnitude spectrum. We can see that the amplitude of both is the same, uh, pretty much close to 500. Um, so we can see the benefits of, z uh, of zero padding there pretty clearly. Okay, so what should be reasonably apparent is that zero padding by a thousand works well for any signal that has a uh, uh, an integer plus a half uh, number of cycles over the duration of the signal being analyzed. But zero padding by a thousand wouldn't work well for um, for sinusoids of other frequencies. And maybe I'll just illustrate that fact by just changing the script a little bit. Um, what I'm going to do is change this to 3.2. Uh, and <coughs> If I just evaluate this part of the code now and replot the magnitude spectrum, we'll see what happens. And we can see that the shape of the magnitude spectrums have now changed, uh, well, 
significantly for this lower uh, frequency. Now this one is also changed but that's more due to um, interference of um, side lobe terms which could be reduced using windowing if you've if you've, if you've seen earlier videos you'll appreciate that. Um, but we can see that this component has sig significantly changed and the, the amplitude has dropped slightly. Um, now a workaround to that problem in this case would be to zero pad by uh, by 4000 rather than 1000 uh, and the reason why I say that is because there would is there is then an opportunity for the DFT to match exactly the frequency of the 3.2 Hertz component with one of its uh, sinusoidal basis functions and maybe I'll just make that change so that you can uh, appreciate it so what I'm going to do is zero pad by uh, 4000 rather than 2000 um, or sorry rather than 1000 I'm going to change the number of bins to display um, I'm going to increase that by a factor of 4 as well and let's just reevaluate all this Okay, and we can see here in our magnitude spectrum that um, the shape of the uh, the associated with the shape of the components in the magnitude spectrum are now very similar again, um, basically because of zero padded by an appropriate amount, and it uh, the amount allowed the DFT to find sinusoidal basis functions which match the frequency of the sinusoidal component in the signal that I was analyzing. Now the thing is we don't generally know the frequency of the sinusoidal components present in a signal so uh, it's difficult to predict how much is zero pad and in general what we do is zero pad by a large amount because the more we zero pad the greater the opportunity for the discrete Fourier transform analysis to find a sinusoidal basis function which will match the frequency of the component present in the signal. Um, hopefully that makes some sense and um, there the, that's one of the key points that I'd like to leave you with.